Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so yeah, I work for people on Drupal Staris, and uh, this is a talk about uh, looking into a different way of uh, distributing container images. Um, so uh, I work for Pivotal Cloud Foundry, uh, the open source container runtime of Cloud Foundry. Uh, we have a team called GroutFS. It is not a file system. It's just doing container management for uh, our Cloud Foundry container runtime. And um, I used to work for CERN, which is why I get uh, this talk. So uh, this is a Docker command. You probably know all about it. It's going to run Elasticsearch. It's in particular, it's going to run a specific version of uh, Elasticsearch. This works, OK. And um, this last bit, this last string, is what we call a container image. Well, in fact, it's a, con it's a reference to a container image. Um, so what is really a container image? Uh, there are some standards currently. There is uh, the AppC. Uh, there is the uh, Docker images format. And there is the OCI standard, which is kind of trying to become the open source uh, owned by Lynx Foundation standard. Uh, for all the container images. And uh, what these standards define is mainly the image layout. And what, what the image is, is basically a set of layers uh, plus some configuration or metadata. Uh, well, let's focus a little bit on the layers. Um, this is a Docker file. Again, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with it. And um, a Docker file is essentially a recipe to build container images with Docker. Uh, Docker is a very good tool to build container images. And the way this file is structured is that at the top, you have this statement from Python 3.5, which is essentially defining the base image. Uh, this is the image you are going to inherit to build your own image. Uh, in the second layer, it's adding the source code. So that is not that is Python agnostic. Like you get any, um, any application you're running is probably going to have some source code. The third layer is installing some dependencies. Again, similar. It doesn't have to be Python dependencies. And the last one is purely configuration. The last one is just saying, uh, when you run this container, this is the entry point. This is a command you're going to run uh, to start this application. So these lines match up with layers. And um, we mentioned that container images are composed of layers. And a layer is essentially, essentially is a set of files and directories, it's a set of file system changes that is applied on top of a different layer, on top of the previous layer, and then it's making a root file system for the container to run. Uh, so a container uh, root file system is essentially an ordered combination of these layers. The order is important. So again, similarly to the Docker file, uh, we start with a from statement. So this defines the base image. Uh, in this case, I am depicting the base image as having two layers. That is not true for Python, but it doesn't really matter. So we have the base image layers. And then its other step of the Docker file maps to a layer. So we have the green layer, which is adding the source code. And we have the orange layer, which is installing the dependencies. Distribution is a bit less formalized. So uh, we have uh, you know, some standards around image formats. And these standards look a lot like each other. So they all uh, talk about layers. But distribution is a bit less uh, well-defined. So we have Docker, which is using registries. And uh, a registry essentially is an HTTP server. So when you're downloading the layers, you're, uh, as a client, as a Docker client, you're going and fetching all these layers through HTTP. Um, the cool thing about layering is that uh, you have to apply them in a certain order, but you don't necessarily have to download them in a certain order. So you can parallelize downloads and serialize the unpacking of the layers. Uh, so just three examples of uh, casting. So if you start up within your container and you don't have any casts, you will download all the layers. Uh, but if you uh, have the base image cast, so if you use a, a different container that already was based in Python 3.5, you will only download the layers that uh, add the code and install the dependencies. And the great thing is that when you change your container image, when you install a different dependency, for instance, this will only change the last layer. So it will only, the client will only have to download the last layer. Everything else will be cast. So this is the situation as it is today. And I'd like to talk about something else. I'd like to talk about distributing software in high physics. And um, this is done in a way that doesn't involve containers. Uh, let me first talk about the problems that uh, 
physicists have. Um, so the software in high energy physics world, and I'm sure in other scientific computation worlds, changes frequently because new models come along. Uh, physicists are not the best people to write code, so they have to, you know, come back and fix things. And um, uh, the software that is used in high energy physics is coming from the four main experiments that are in CERN, and there are like various other experiments in smaller institutes around the world that are contributing to this uh, set of software. Another interesting thing, apart from frequent releases, is that the software for high energy physics is very complicated. So every experiment has its own stack, uh, which is usually experiments share some common library. So they share the simulation library or the data analysis library but they still vendor it despite sharing them because they usually have their own patches, they implement their own models, and so on and so forth. And on top of that, they have the detector geometries and various other tunings and configurations that make up very large software stacks. Usually we're talking about gigabytes in large experiments. And imagine if you have these stacks coming up every, every day or every week, new releases. Um, another thing is that when you're distributing these releases, you have to actually have all of the old versions online. And if not all, you have to have a lot of old versions online because it is very, it's sometimes the case that they have to run old software with newer data or uh, new software with older data to validate some assumptions and to try against different models. Uh, usually, uh, the software is running in the worldwide LHC computing grid. This is spread across multiple countries and many data centers. and um, they're running hundreds of thousands of parallel jobs every day. So we have four main experiments. That means tens of thousands of parallel jobs every day for each experiment. So these jobs are usually Monte Carlo simulation or data analysis. But the interesting thing here is that you, you can imagine having tens of thousands of parallel jobs coming and requesting for the latest release from the release server or whatever distribution mechanism you're using. And here is where CERN-BMFS comes into the play. So they tried various packaging techniques before, and it didn't work out very well, uh, mainly because of the extent of the grid, the geographical distribution, the size of the releases. It's all very expensive to just send a release every day to all the grid nodes. So CERN-MFS is a file system. It doesn't understand about packages. It doesn't understand about uh, layers. It knows about files and directories. It's an anchor file system uh, in Fuse. We're going to talk about that. And it lazily downloads files when they are accessed. So you won't have to, when you're starting a new job with the latest release, you won't have to download the whole release just to start the job. It will just download the files when it actually uses these files. And we can only download the files that needs to uh, run the software. Uh, because it's very common that because of the size of the release, the grid jobs don't necessarily require the whole release to, uh, to run the application they need. The other important thing is a duplication. So every file that is stored in CERN-MFS is signed with a content address, and then it's only downloaded once. So if you have two experiments, or if you have the same file twice, you will only going to cast it once. You won't have to download it twice. And this is, again, similar to the layers world, where you have a layer with a content address. So you have an application. You have a grid job running, and it's trying to access the file. So it's making the... Uh, open Cisco, which is going to the VFS module of the kernel, uh, as with every uh, file system Cisco. And we said this is a Fuse file system, so this will delegate to the Fuse kernel module. Um, now, it is important to use Fuse because Fuse lets essentially the client, the, the, the process that will um, go and fetch this file, to be to run in the user space, which is good for security reasons, and it also gives you a much better flexibility for developing code, because when you develop kernel code, it's much harder than developing a user application. Um, so this will delegate to the CERN-BMFS client, which will go to the CERN-BMFS server. Uh, it is an HTTP server. And the first thing it will do is we'll try to fetch the catalog. So uh, our, our process needs dir file, and then the CERN-BMFS client will go and fetch the catalog for, sl for slash dir. And the catalog basically knows about the has of this file. So it knows the content address of this file, and then the client can go and fetch this. Now, all these operations are cast. So the catalog will be cast, and the blob will be cast. So 
are there any similarities between high energy physics software distribution and container images? And I think there are. I think there are mainly two. The first one is, I mentioned that grid jobs don't use the whole stack. This is also true for containers. They, they don't really use the whole stack. They, Nginx, for instance, it's only using 11 megabytes just to start of a 190 megabyte image. The same applies for Node, and the same applies for uh, Redis. So this was Redis, yeah. Uh, and you can see here the percentage of like the, the image that it actually uses to start the process. Now, further down the line, it might need more files, might have to access extra libraries or anything, but just to boot a container, you don't really need to download a 200 megabyte or a 400 megabyte image. The other common, the other similarity is that um, different versions uh, change little uh, percentage of the image. So they don't have as frequent, you don't have as frequent versions, as frequent releases as in CERN, but you still have uh, releases and they don't change the whole image. Uh, so for instance, from Nginx 1.10 to 1.11, it only changes four megabytes, but the layers that it touches, which is the layers that you have to redownload, are 58 megabytes. So you download 14 times more than you actually need in terms of a div. Right, so uh, I'm going to show you a demo about on using CERMFS with RANC. Uh, so let's see how this goes. All right. How's the font size? All right. Okay. So this is running in a, an AWS VM. Uh, so I'm just connecting it to this VM. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to try and mount my Serbian FS repo. So I went ahead and created a Serbian well, FS server uh, with um, a repository that has two container images, Nginx and Redis. So I'm going to uh, make this directory, container images, container images AWS, and then mount the Serbian FS endpoint. So this is not very slow operation necessarily. It's using Fuse under the hood. And uh, just to show you what this repository contains, it has a config and image directory. And in the image directory, I have Redis and Nginx. And this is Redis 323. So I'm just uh, downloaded the image from Docker Hub and unpacked it inside a CermiFS repo. Uh, now I'm going to create a Runcy container. So Runcy was mentioned before. It's, it's not a container runtime, it's uh, a tool, basically. Uh, it's a, a tool that speaks a very low level interface. It's used to build container runtime. So Garden, the Cloud Foundry container runtime is using it, and Docker is using it as well. Um, so it doesn't necessarily deal with everything that Docker deals. So it doesn't deal with networking, for instance. All right, so I'm going to create a bundle. Uh, a bundle is uh, the notion of a container directory for uh, run C. So it needs that, it needs a configuration inside the bundle to create a container. And inside this bundle, we have to have a rootfs directory, which is what it's going to use, what the container is going to use as its root file system. And because CermiFS is a read-only file system, I will create a rw directory, which is I'm going to use as a, a overlay for writes to go into. So to make this work, I'm going to use AUFS. Um, that is just to basically mount the CermiFS read-only uh, mount point into this rootfs directory. So if you now look into RootFS, we have all the files uh, that we, we saw in the CermiFS repo, and we can write stuff in here. The next, the next step is to create a configuration for RunC. Uh, this OCI tools uh, is another tool Open Container Sensitive provides, and uh, this will create me the right configuration for RunC to work. And the only thing I have to do now is to RunC run, run uh, this container, which will bring up Redis. Again, this is on a VM without any CAS. So when it actually referenced Redis server, it just went ahead and fetched Redis server from the, uh, from the SDP server. OK, yeah, this is, uh, I mentioned this already. So this was fast. We didn't have to pull any image. We didn't have to download anything more than we actually needed. Uh, but how fast is fast? So I did a small experiment here. Uh, I used. ICE, which is something I developed for my thesis, and uh, you can find it online. Uh, or if you're interested in how I run the experiment, there is a repo in GitHub uh, named Container Camp. Uh, you can find all about it. And I used 20 AWS VMs in Ireland, and the server is 
uh, in Frankfurt, I believe. Yeah. So one experiment is run SQL receiving FS, the same thing we saw with our uh, demo, and the other one is Docker with Docker Hub. So the scenario here is I want to run Redis. Uh, so I'm running, I'm starting Redis server as a daemon, and then in a while loop, I'm pinging it to see when it's going com to come up, and I'm measuring the time this takes. This is the results. So, okay. So the blue line is basically the run C performance. It takes about two to four seconds for the server to come up as we saw in the demo. Uh, the green line, which is far up, it's Docker with a cold cast. So it takes about 40 seconds to download the image and to start the container. And the red line is Docker right after it populated its cast. Uh, there's a big difference between the red and the blue line, which is, as I said before, Runcy doesn't do everything Docker does, doesn't deal with networking, for instance, which takes all the time. But we can see there's a 30 second penalty just for fetching an image that you don't actually need the whole, uh, the whole of it. Uh, another approach, if you don't want to use RMFS, is IPFS. Um, this is another fuse file system. It's it has a very cool name, interplanetary file system, and it offers similar characteristics. It has the duplication, so every object, object can be a directory or a file or a diff, uh, is only stored once with a content address. Uh, it, ha it keeps history for every object, and it's decentralized. This is the very interesting thing about IPFS, that all the transmissions, all the transfers, are actually happening between in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Um, but still, with IPFS, it would really make sense to use files in the layers. So just to, instead of a conclusion, I'd like to mention a few use cases that may make this uh, work interesting. Um, so the selfish use case is a CI server. I, I really hate waiting for uh, jobs to build just because I have to pull a huge container image. And I really hate when I make a, a tiny change in my container image to have to, pull the whole, to have to push the whole thing back to Docker Hub. Um, a more realistic use case is clusters. Uh, we saw a small cluster of 20 VMs and how it performed. Uh, if you have a larger cluster of hundreds of VMs and they all try to pull the same units at the same time, it will take time. It will, might result, result to network contention. And if you're uh, maintaining your own private registry uh, for, for, for serving proprietary software, then this will probably hit the registry as well. And the last, with a question mark here, is serverless. So um, one of the implementations of serverless could be container pools. So you don't start the container when you actually hit the event, but you have a pool of containers, and then you wait for events to come, and then when an event hits, you just use a ready container. Uh, it will save us a lot of time if we just don't have to download all the layers for every worker. So yeah, that's it. Thank you.